Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syriana Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Almasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all, whether you're watching me on YouTube or on Rumble. One of the unfortunate truths that most of the podcasters or journalists or anyone interested in history or politics or geopolitics that we do not really share with our audience is that wars are also an opportunity for us to educate ourselves about these difficult conditions and difficult crisis, right? One of which is, of course, the Ukraine war. In 2014, for example, when the coup happened in Ukraine, and I was sitting in the office with my former boss, who is a geopolitical expert and a professor of history and international relations, he told me lots of Histories, uh, history and stories about World War II, about Stalingrad, about Leningrad, and about the sieges and about the collaboration of some of the European countries with Nazi Germany against Russia. And it was mind-blowing for me because what I learned in history books, and especially when I first started reading the history of World War II from the internet, it was a little bit different from what I heard from him, right? But then we had the hot war between Ukraine and Russia and this hysteria against Russia and pure Russophobia right, against Russia from some of the people in Europe and also the governments, some of the governments in Europe and the United States against Russia, and to extent that for me, as a rational person, just trying to see what's happening here from a geopolitical perspective, for me, it doesn't make sense why some of the European governments are taking certain decisions that harms them. And it seems to me that this is more based on ideological premises and ideological foundations rather than geopolitical calculations or national security. So I want to know what's happening. I want to know why. This is the thing that always keeps me awake at night, right? I'm a person that asks the why. Why, why, why? And when I was a kid, when I was a child, my father uh, was sick and tired of me for asking him why. And when he answers the question, I have a why for that answer, right? I want to know. I'm, I'm uh, in German, they say uh, neugierig. I'm very curious. I want to know what's happening and why it's happening and why these people are feeling that way. Of course, one of the reasons why there is Russophobia, in, especially in Eastern Europe, because of the concurrence of the Soviet Union of these countries, and in some occasions, the mistreatment of the Soviet Union of the people in these countries from their perspective. So they have, of course, grievances, but that's not the entire picture. There is also... The other side of the story, and that is some of these people collaborated with Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union. And it was the Soviet Union that came under attack by Nazi Germany and lost millions and millions and millions of people from its own soldiers and from its own citizens to defeat Nazi Germany. Right. Personally, guys, I really have no problem with any person who holds any, type, any opinion as long as this person is not harming me. For example, even if you choose somebody was not really what is not smart was not even if somebody is uh, not smart enough and has chosen the an ideology like Nazism, right? I don't care if you picked that ideology as long as you're not coming close to me, as long as you're not harming people. Although these ideologies can generate violence, right? So this is one of the things that I have to tell YouTube now that I don't endorse any of these radical ideologies, violent ideologies. I'm a peaceful person and the purpose of these videos are for educational purposes, right? So even if you picked that ideology, okay, it's your problem. It's not my problem. But if you come close to me, then I might fight against you. My problem is that re the revision of history if certain people or certain groups or certain political parties or certain armies in World War II helped Nazi Germany or they believed in the project of Nazi Germany or just out of hate toward Russia joined the Nazi forces, the SS battalions against the Soviet Union, 
you have to tell the truth about this. You cannot come and say that, oh, we were against Nazis when your ancestors were with the Nazis and you are endorsing your ancestors today and you are installing today mon uh, monuments for your ancestors who fought against the Soviet Union. And one of these countries is, unfortunately, that I didn't know, as I mentioned, one of the unfortunate truths about the wars and about this geopolitical crisis that it also educates us. So I was, I was reading this statement of the Estonian foreign minister, an ex formerly known as Trichter, and they were basically saying that the Russian barbarity, I'm paraphrasing, I will show you now the screenshot. The Russian barbarity is not new for us. And 80 years ago today, the Russians bombed the city of Tallinn, and they have killed hundreds of people. And this is something like it's the norm for the Russians. They do this for uh, sports, you know, like they kill people because they like killing people. This, this was the overall general context of it. So I was like, what's happening here, right? I want to know. So uh, first of all, let me show you the screenshot of uh, the... So this is the Estonian Foreign Ministry uh, account, the official one. Hashtag I stand with Ukraine. They say today, 80 years ago, Estonia or Tallinn, Estonia was devastated by the March bombings, which destroyed a quarter of the city overnight. Up to 300 Russian aircrafts were bombing us, bombing us, see, bombing us. And the primary targets were residential districts and cultural landmarks. The Russian playbook is the same today in Ukraine. First of all, it's really, it's really, um, it, 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 like, it awakened my curiosity to know what happened that day. So I digged in a little bit in history. And I just wanted to say here something. <laughs> I think I'm going to ratio them soon. Uh, I said, Russia was, quote, bombing us 80 years ago in the case that you endorsed the Nazis in Estonia during World War II, or am I missing something? I mean, why I said this? Because 80 years ago, when the Soviet Union bombed Estonia, and especially the city of Tallinn, the city was in the hands of Nazi Germany and the Estonian collaborators. And the Russians didn't choose and pick to bomb uh, Tallinn for sports, the cultural census, like they say nowadays, right? This was something very important for me to understand why the Russians bombed Tallinn. So in March 1944, this was the bombing uh, date, right, that they have set up. So Germany's, if we remember before 44, what, what, was, what was the most important military event and the security event that was ongoing? It was Germany's siege of Leningrad, right? Between 1941 and 1944. Wow, okay. So the Germany siege of Leningrad was finally lifted on January 1944. And in January 1944, uh, 1.5 million uh, Soviet people were killed between these four years of uh, siege or three years of siege, and many of them were of starvation. So what happened during this time? Were the Estonians, Estonians playing any role against the starvation and against the siege of Leningrad? That's a really good point. That's a really good question. But first of all, to understand the gravity of the issue, we have to check what was this Leningrad siege was about, right? So I found this very short reportage. I think it's important for us first to learn what was the Leningrad siege. Let's take, it, let's take a look together first. The siege of Leningrad was the most destructive siege of any city in world history, claiming the lives of more than a million residents in the second most important Soviet city. The siege of Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, began on September 8th of 1941 and lasted until January 27th of 1944. The Germans tried to shell and bomb the city into submission, yet the citizens did not give up. They believed surrendering was never an option. Despite evacuation orders, three million citizens prepared for the siege. This date and the official start of the siege is when the town of Schlieselberg was captured on the shores of Lake Ladoga trapping troops, ships, and civilians. A failed storming event by the Germans turned Leningrad into a fortress with 600 kilometers of defenses, 15,000 bunkers, and 4,600 shelters. 
The now limited deliveries could not cover the needs of a large city like Leningrad. And with the onset of the harsh winter of 1941 to 42, famine began. However, after the Germans were defeated in Stalingrad, the Red Army's Iskra Offensive restored land communications and Operation January Thunder expelled the enemy, ending the threat. So January 27th, 1944 marked the siege lifting after 872 days. In the Special Supplement Information Bulletin, Leningrad Stalingrad produced by the Embassy of the USSR in 1944, it included this appeal from the leaders of Leningrad. The enemy is cruel and relentless. His brutality knows no bounds. By good organization, fortitude, courage, and by the ruthless annihilation of the Nazi murderers, will we be able to stop the bloody violence loosed upon the Soviet people and ward off the grave danger menacing our city? So, this was the political context of the siege of Leningrad. But if you want to see the siege from a military perspective and how many people perished during this and how many soldiers each side deployed and from where, right? This is important. From which direction the Nazi forces were coming and their collaborators, whether in Finland or in Estonia, against Leningrad, right? I think the map here is very clear. And it's very, uh, in my opinion, um, interactive. And uh, this is a good one. I just want you guys to check the dates on the right uh, dates and the casualties and the amount of forces of each side when they were concurring or trying to conquer uh, Leningrad. By the, by the way, if you see the map, the, they were, of course, uh, trying to uh, come also from Finland, but also from Estonia, from the, uh, the west here. so around 3.5 million um, casualties among the Soviets to break the siege of Leningrad. And in the city, 1.5 million people died from starvation and from bombing and from the siege of Leningrad. And the axis of uh, the Nazis were from Finland and from the, the, the western part to Leningrad. And if we see this map, of map, if you put the map in front of us and ask ourselves, when the Soviets lifted the, the siege, where could the Nazi forces would, could have uh, gone, right? Evacuated. And if we put the map of control in front of us, we will see that one of the cities that is uh, close to Leningrad, nowadays St. Petersburg, is Tallinn, where now the Estonian foreign ministry claims that the Russians just bombed it for sports, right? So... Um, and Tallinn was 229 miles away, by the way, from west of uh, St. Petersburg. So have the Russians, the Soviets, used brutal force in Tallinn? Yes, of course, they used. Uh, how many people died during this bombing? 750 people died, guys. Uh, among them, 580 civilians. Tragic. Bad, right? I mean, I mean but if I want to speak about history, and I will... And I don't mention at all that 1.5 million uh, civilians died in Leningrad and in, uh, um, in the siege. I'm, I'm a hypocrite, right? And I'm doing historical revisionism. And if I don't mention that my country or my people were collaborators with Nazi Germany against the Soviets, 
uh, and to just paint the Russians that they are just barbarians, this is historical revisionism, right? History of revisionism. So context really matters. And there is also something very important, and that is that the Allies actually also bombed Tallinn. It's, it wasn't only the Russians who were bombing Tallinn, but also the Allies, Canada, America, Britain, they also intervened at the later stage of the World War II, started bombing Nazi Germany because they found that the Nazis are going to lose the war, right? And they don't want to give the Russians all the victory because they will have a full control and absolute control over Europe if they uh, defeat the Nazis alone, right? And this is the map. I think it's important to check this map, guys. This is the map. As you can see, Leningrad was here. This is the front. And when the uh, Nazi forces, uh, I mean, from Finland, they were attacking against Leningrad and, and also from the West. So when the siege was lifted from this area, the soldiers most likely, I mean, where would you retreat? You're either going to the southwest or you're going to the east. So Tallinn, this city, which was uh, uh, in any ways under the occupation of the Nazis, and they were embraced by the people there. And this is something very important that we have to mention. I apologize for it, but there were so many people in Estonia who were in favor of Nazi Germany. And they were uh, celebrating the occupation of Nazi Germany and they embraced Nazi Germany and they joined the ranks of Nazi Germany. And up until today, there are monuments for their grand hero grandfathers who fought against the Russians. Right? And I'm going to show all the evidence for this information because I was trying to do my own homework and learn what's happening. So I want to share with you because this is important for us to understand what's happening today also in Ukraine, right? I came uh, to the comment of uh, a journalist from Canada uh, who said, who wrote this on uh, the page of uh, um, the Estonian foreign uh, ministry. She said, what weird rewriting of history are you people doing in little Estonia? Exactly 80 years ago, the Allies, which if you read history, you know, included Canada, the Soviet Union, the United States, the UK, were eradicating German Nazis from Europe. And at the time, your little place was part of German-won territory and the Allies freed it from Nazis. You are tweeting that you regret the actions of the Allies to remove Nazi Germany from your country. A significant number of Canadians died with our Allies to give you people freedom. Please have some respect for the sacrifices made for you by us. And this woman, she's not a Russian propagandist. She doesn't work for Russia. And I checked her back, but she's a more mainstreamish uh, journalist, right? So it's really horrible to see this, uh, the, the way they are trying to distort history, and which encouraged me to check more into history. And one of the commentators uh, posted this photo from Estonia. Estonians greeted German soldiers as liberators in Tallinn. This is from the archives of the war. And uh, the Germans were welcomed in this uh, when they occupied Estonia. And from Estonia, it was like a starting point, you know, like the invading ground to uh, against the Soviet Union. Uh, one of the commentators also said they bombed Nazis, Nazi Germany troops, to be precise. Estonia was occupied by Nazi Germany army and at this moment for like two and a half years. And significant part of locals happily took their part in Holocaust until Soviets returned. So did the Estonians participate in the Holocaust, which means like uh, the mass murder of the not only the Jewish people, the Polish people and also other minorities? I mean, I, I, you will be mind blown, guys, by the information that I found about these cases. Now, the, uh, George uh, Papanikolaou is from Greece. He said, remarkable post. Some of us know about the history of Estonia and USSR, but reminding people that a lot of Estonians were on the side of Nazi Germany and Hitler, for whatever reason, is not so wise. And actually, it's, it's really not wise what they're doing because they're even giving um, like a free uh talking points to the russians nowadays right and now if the russians say oh now we have to denazify estonia you know like they have like a, a like a ready <laughs> something ready for them to use and to justify if they're going to invade and conquer estonia for example uh, violet says estonia was the first to be declared judenfrei 
Judenfrei in Germany means free of Jews. And uh, did the bombing have anything to do with that? She asks. So, guys, there are so many allegations here against Estonia. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell is happening? Because if you remember in the last uh, episode with uh, um, the expert from Sweden in the military affairs, I asked him about Sweden and the collaboration of Sweden with Nazi Germany. They were selling uh, Sweden, they were selling Germany from Sweden steel and iron for military production. And he said, yes, that's what happened, right? So I digged in a little bit. And this is coming, of course, from uh, all Jewish and uh, uh, websites, historical websites. Now, just apologies. It seems that my browser started to be frozen now. Frozen. Okay. So, okay, now I'm back. So this is from the Holocaust Encyclopedia, right? In the Holocaust Encyclopedia say, in summer of 1941, following the German invasion of the Soviet Union, the Nazis gradually occupied Estonia. Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian, Ukrainian, and ethnic German collaborators played a significant role in killing Jews throughout Eastern and Southeastern Europe. And they are locating the mass execution sites in Estonia here, um, with pictures where they were executing the uh, the um, the Jewish people and also the deportation from the es uh, Estonia and other Lithuania and other these uh, smaller Baltic countries uh, or the Nordic countries to the ghettos, for example, right? So those are the corpses of the Jewish people when uh, the Soviets uh, occupied or liberated Estonia, call it whatever you want, and they found these um, mass corpses and they prepared them for uh, burning because they were spreading diseases. So this is again all the photos of the dead people, uh, pictures taken by the Soviet Union. So I, I really wanted to know, you know, and this stuff are all unfortunately true. And one of which is that Estonia was declared Judenfrei which means free of Jews. And why I'm telling you this story? Because nowadays there are all these allegations against the people of the Middle East that they are anti-Semites. And if you know that I'm, I'm from the Middle East and anti-Semitism is not a Middle Eastern problem. Anti-Semitism and Jew hating is not a Middle Eastern problem. It is a European problem. And then they project it on us in the Middle East and they say, oh, you hate Israel or Israeli policies, policies then you are an anti-Semite. You know, this is your problem. You committed the Holocaust. You killed the Jewish people with hundreds of thousands of them, not us. And so don't hold us responsibility for your actions, Habibi. And unfortunately, uh, this is also another information that I learned today. And they were uh, something called Judenfrei zones, which means um, areas that were all free of the Jews. And this has happened in during World War II. Judenfrei or Judenrein, which means the clean of Jews. Judenfrei is free of Jews. Judenrein means the clean of Jews. Are terms of Nazi origin to designate an area that has been caught cleansed of Jews during the Holocaust. While Judenfrei refers merely to freeing an area of all of its Jewish inhabitants, the term Judenrein literally means clean of Jews, has the even stronger connotation that any trace of Jewish blood had been removed as an alleged impunity in the minds of the criminal perpetrators. Judenfrei describes the local Jewish population having been removed from a town, region, or country by forced evacuation during the Holocaust, True, many Jews were hidden by local people. Removal methods included forced rehousing in Nazi ghettos, especially in Eastern Europe, and forced removal or settlement to the East by German troops, often to their death. Most Jews were identified from late 1941 by the Yellow Badge as a result of pressure from Joseph Goebbels and Heinrich Himmler. So what areas were declared Judenfrei? Uh, in Germany, there was an area called Gelnhausen and Karl. Those are, in Germany, they were declared Judenfrei in 1938. In German-occupied Bitgosts in Poland, uh, reported Judenfrei in December 1939. The German-annexed Alsace, this is in France, 
reported Juden Rhein by Robert Heinrich Wagner in July 1940. Banat in German occupied territory of Serbia reported Juden Frey in Octo- on, Oct- on uh, 19th August 1941. Just a second, let me check. Yes. The German occupied Luxembourg reported Juden Frey by the press on the 17th of October 1941. German occupied Estonia that we are speaking about today was declared a Juden Frey in December 1941. Independent state of Croatia declared Juden Frey by the Interior Minister Andrea Artukovic in February 1942, but Germany suspected that this was not true and the authorities from Berlin sent uh, Franz Abromait to assess the situation. Then Vienna, Berlin, Erlangen, those are all declared Juden Frey. And if we see this map, this map was used in the conference called Wannsee Conference, and I just want to see if we can maybe see it in a bigger, um, let me see if we can, yeah. So this is the map, guys, used during a conference called Wannsee Conference for the Nazis. And this is Estonia, right, uh, on, on, on the map. And it's, called, it's, it's written here, Judenfrei. See? So um, they declared Estonia as an area that is free of the Jewish people because they exterminated them. They killed them, actually. And in the Van Zee conference that I am mentioning now, I also want to show you some details from this Van Zee conference. So the Van Zee conference, uh, it happened in the suburbs of Berlin on the 20th of January, 1942. And if we see what happened during the proceedings, they say in preparation for the conference, Eichmann drafted a list of the total numbers of Jews in the various European countries. Countries were listed in two groups, A and B. A were the countries, those under direct uh, German control of occupation, and B were the countries, whether allied or client states uh, with Germany or neutral or at war with Germany. Now, the numbers reflect the estimated Jewish people within each country. For example, Estonia is listed a Judenfrei, free of Jews, since the 4,500 Jewish people who remained in Estonia after the occupation of Nazi Germany of Estonia were killed by the end of 1941. See, it's crazy. It's crazy how much of uh, atrocities happened back then against the Jewish people and the rise of anti-Semitism was real. This is the real anti-Semitism, right? Not the anti-Semitism that they accuse the people today if they criticize uh, 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 the Israeli onslaught and barbarism against the Palestinians in Gaza. This is the anti-Semitism that they want to project their guilt and their crimes on the people in the Middle East and call us anti-Semites. We're not anti-Semites. The Jewish people lived in the Middle East among the Arabic people, among the Muslim people, among the Christian people in peace and harmony. And we didn't persecute them. In the contrary, for example, when the Portuguese and the Spanish, they decided to persecute the Jewish people, the Jews escaped from their countries to Northern Africa, to North Africa. And that's that's what explains the presence of the Jewish people in countries like Morocco, for example, nowadays, right? Somebody comes and tells you, I'm a Jew from Morocco. How did the Jewish person reach there or arrive there? It's because of the persecution in Europe and especially in Spain and in uh, Portugal hundreds of years ago. And they uh, fled the anti-Semitism to our countries and they found uh, shelter here, right? But we are against the occupation of Palestinian people's lands, whoever is the occupier, whether they are Hindus, whether they are Buddhists, whether they are the Jews, whether whoever they are. I don't care. If the Christians come, and I'm a Christian, right? And they say, I'm going to establish a, just a state for the Christian people in Palestine, I will oppose to it, right? Palestine is for everyone. Palestine for the Christians, for the Muslims, for the Jews, for the atheists, for the agnostics, for everyone. But if you want to make it a one-color state, I will oppose it. Just like I oppose the so-called revolutionaries in Syria because they wanted to establish a one-color state. Only for them. 
only for the Muslim bothered and the Salafi minded people. And the rest, they were saying, oh, the Christians go to Beirut and the Alawites to the coffins. No, Habibi, it doesn't work that way. I'm against this type of fascism and I will fight against it. And, and the irony is that we, the people who fight against this fascism, we're the ones who are accused of fascism. It's an upside down word because truth tellers nowadays are accused of fascism and the truth tellers and the people who fight or push against the state, uh, the fascistic practices of any state institutions, then they call you fascist because uh, they want to discredit you and they want to tarnish your reputation and they own most of the media. So they are able to ruin your reputation and ruin your uh, career. It's easy nowadays for them to do that. And I was wondering this, I was telling myself, like in this, especially in the current situation in Palestine, people keep talking about, um, oh, we are heading toward fascism, you know? And I think fascism is already, it's already here. I cannot count how many people I know that they lost their jobs and their careers nowadays. And one day when I'm in a safer environment and I will have the opportunity to speak about all these cases again, I will tell you all these stories. I know so many people who lost their jobs and they, I know people who are freelancers, by the way, they have not received one single job contract since the October 7 uh, events and attacks and the Israeli onslaught against Gaza because they have shown solidarity with the Palestinians. Zero. Zero income. There are people receiving letters from their work, so telling them one of their colleagues uh, have made a screenshot of his or her post on Facebook or on Twitter, and they say, um, "Yeah, you're sy sympathizing with terrorism." You know, if you sympathize with the Palestinians, then you're sympathizing with Hamas. This is how they equal everything nowadays. So you're you you don't belong to this institution, and they kick you out. Unfortunately, guys, while we're watching this live streaming, I would really appreciate it if you just hit the like button. It really helps me with the algorithm of YouTube and more people can watch this video. I would really appreciate it. Um, and this is not an issue that is only in history. It's also in the present times. Unfortunately, I also find out that in Estonia, they are still glorifying their Nazi past. And this is not from Sputnik. This is not from Russia Today. This is not from a Russian propaganda outlet. This is from the BBC. And this is coming from August 2004. They say Estonia unveils Nazi war monument. An Estonian town has unveiled a controversial monument to honor those who fought with Nazi forces against the Soviet Union in World War II. The monument depicts an Estonian soldier in German military uniform. The local authorities in the western town of Lihula said they wanted to honor those Estonians who had to choose between the two sides. But the Estonian Prime Minister Johan Pars described the monument as a provocation. An investigation is underway into, into whether it could incite political hostility. And of course, this investigation has never seen any light and there was no follow up on it. So they just buried it because they wanted it to happen. The government can say that this is a provocation, but they just uh, keep it under control. And this didn't happen only one time in 2004, but in 2014, this is from an Estonian, by the way, website, and I translated it into English. Russia expressed uh, indignation regarding the funeral of an Estonian war veteran. So this was from the funeral of the uh, former uh, Estonian uh, officer. So on to, this is coming in 2014, January 14, 2014, just for us to keep in mind the dates. The On Tuesday, Russia expressed indignation over the ceremonial uh, funeral of Estonian war veteran. His name is Harald Nugisex, uh, the Interfax news agency reported. Uh, the Russian side said, we express a strong opposition to the course taken, which supports neo-Nazi and revan uh, revanchist sentiments that are taking root in Estonian society. We call on Tallinn to immediately and unconditionally review the approach, which is contrary to Estonia's obligations in the field of international human rights and damages the country's image and damages the country's image as a member of the UN Security Council, said Konstantin Dolgov, Commissioner of the Russian Foreign Ministry. In Tory Church, 
uh, this was uh, in uh, nine, 2014, honorary captain Harald Nugis, honorary member of the Pernuma Maleva and Young Eagles of the Defense League was sent on his last journey. So those are the state institutions and the the uh, from the armed forces of Estonia. The Defense Services fun- funeral ceremony in Tori Church was conducted by Bishop Einar Sune of the Lutheran Church and Lieutenant Colonel Tavi uh, Lanepere. Sorry for all these names, guys. But Anyways, so you see what's happening here in anyways, right? And uh, in July 1941, Nugisex avoided mobilization into the Red Army, but joined the German army in August of the same year. So he chose to join the Nazi forces and not and avoided the mobilization in the Red Army. In 1944, Nugisex participated in the battles on the Narva front and was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross for his bravery during the liquidation of the Vasa Vepskula Sivert's uh, <laughs> bridgehead. At the end of the war, Nugis was sent to Siberia. He arrived in his homeland only in 1958. After Estonia regained its independence, uh, Nugis X participated in the chess activities of whatever so he was he, he was back to estonia and he just lived his life really in estonia and he was later honored and awarded by the state just like in ukraine nowadays and this is a, something that were it not for the ukraine war i wouldn't have known much about for example bandera right i mean i heard about him but i didn't dig in much and learn that for example the mi6 hired him as a collaborator, so that he incites and he mobilizes the people in Ukraine against the Soviet Union after World War II. And and the MI6 has collaborated with many uh, former uh, SS and Nazi generals and officers, and they hired them. They collaborated with them against the Soviet Union. And this is another uh, example coming from um, the website called Forward, um, they say Nazi collaborative monuments in Estonia. So this list is part of an ongoing investigative project. The forward first published in uh, January 2021, documenting hundreds, hundreds of monuments around the world to people involved in the Holocaust. This is in uh, Legedi. The monument below, uh, known as the Monument of uh, Lihula, glorifies the Estonian World War II soldiers, which includes Estonian units of the Waffen-SS, the military wing of Nazi Germany. This is the picture. And this is the uh, depiction of the picture is here nowadays still in uh, Estonia. If we go a little bit uh, uh, down, we can see this uh, stone. Uh, this is in Cinemed Hills. A cross and several memorial stones uh, honor several Waffen SS divisions which fought there in 1944. This includes the 20th Waffen Grenadier Division of the SS, the first Estonian, whose insignia is on the stones left still. It's here. The monument uh, erected in 1999 has become the site of annual gatherings to honor the SS. Due to the participation of local collaborators, Estonia's Jewish population was virtually eradicated within months of Germany invading the country in 1941. The two other memorial stones in the main uh, Sini Mid Hills complex honor the 5 SS, 5 Willigen uh, Sturmbrigade. This is all the French-speaking volunteers from Belgium and Dutch soldiers and also nurses and auxiliaries who volunteered to fight against the USSR. Uh, there are so many examples from current time. People are still um, honoring the memory of the Nazis. This is still in, um, in Tallinn, for example. As you can see, this is a torchlight march organized by the Conservative People's Party of Estonia in Tallinn, February 24, 2020. And they are honoring the, uh, the memory of Harald Nugisex, the guy that we already spoke about that he died in 2014. And this is another example uh, Musla and uh, Viliandi in 2018, Musla installed this plaque glorifying SS uh, standard Führer Alphonse Rabbani, a commander in the 20th Waffen SS division who, like Nugisex, was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. After the war, Rabbani, like many Nazi collaborators, fled to the West and served in the British intelligence just like uh, Bandera. Western governments welcomed thousands of Eastern European Nazi collaborators who became assets in the Cold War. Mashallah, mashallah. Mashallah, mashallah.
So now we understand uh, the sensitivity of the issue. If you're from the Russian side, I'm saying this is this is very sensitive issue. If there is a revival of a neo-Nazi sentiments or sending any sorts of armaments to the neo-Nazi groups, self-proclaimed neo-Nazi groups, right in Ukraine, for example, nowadays, and they're sending them heavy weaponry. For example, the Brits are sending them the Challengers, right? The Challenger Two. And funny enough, the Challenger Two is facing so many problems nowadays in Ukraine. And this is a video of the Challenger and the British uh, correspondent is sitting on the tank. And he said, uh, the journalists are from the Sun came to Ukraine to film their royal uh, Wunderwaffe, the challenged to tank in action, but they got stuck in mud. So they had to bring in another Challenger to tank to pull it up. So even just on a training exercise, we've seen the main problem that the challenge has been facing here in Ukraine, and that's its mobility. It keeps getting stuck in the mud. And if you have a look at the terrain, it's this soft, deep, rich black soil that's been proving problematic for it in this war. It's been one of the messages that the Ukrainian tank crews have given us since we got here is that whilst this Challenger is formidably precise, actually they've had real problems with it here in Ukraine because of its mobility. And they just said it's too heavy, it's underpowered, and it keeps getting stuck. And you can see that's exactly what has happened here. The belly of the tank is on the mud. We're trying to cross a small ditch, really, you know, a few meters wide, but it's clearly very wet, very soggy. And the tank has just sunk in, slid in, and now they're waiting for a recovery vehicle. It's funny how they try to blur the faces of the journalists and the number of the tank as if the Russians cannot see it with the drone or with the satellite imagery. <laughs> this, this is, the, but but uh, you you get the point, right? From the historical context, when you're going to send this type of weaponry now to Ukraine, the Russians will use this and put it in the context of World War II and say, yeah, look, the the the, the people who supported the neo Nazis or the Nazis back then against us, they're doing the same thing now. Right, and there is a track history after World War II that the MI6 and even the CIA they collaborated with the Nazi generals and they even hired them in their ranks to learn from their experience. Right, and uh, this has pushed and and um, encouraged Russia to accelerate its military production. And this is something that is being recently acknowledged because this was something that uh, the Russians were mocked. And uh, the, the Ursula von der Leyen was saying that the Russians are fighting with the the, uh, the parts of the uh, washing machine and uh, the electronics, right? What they have uh, left in, in, in the country. I mean, those people are completely ignorant or probably liars. And now the CNN acknowledges this exclusive. Russia producing three times more artillery shells than the US and Europe together combined for Ukraine. Russia appears on track to produce nearly three times more artillery munitions than the US and Europe together, a key advantage ahead of what is expected to be another Russian offensive in Ukraine later this year. Russia is producing, guys, 250,000 artillery munitions per month. Every month, 250,000 artillery munitions, or about 3 million a year according to NATO intelligence estimates. Collectively, the US and Europe have the capacity to generate only 1.2 million munitions annually to send to Kiev. So if Russia is producing 3 million munitions and the United States and Europe together are producing, let's say, 40 to 35% of what the, um, the Russians are producing, and they are sending everything that they can to Ukraine, if something happens in their countries, they will not have a munition, right? And even if they have the enough munitions, they are sending all these munitions sent to Ukraine is not enough in this combat war. The 
Russians have the superiority in the munition production here. The U.S. military set a goal to produce 100,000 rounds of artillery a month by the end of 2025. So from now, 2024, we are at the beginning of 2024 to 2025, they are trying to increase the production to 100,000 rounds of artillery per month. At the current moment now, in 2023... 2024, Russia is producing 250,000. So even if they accelerate the production next year or in the next two years to 100,000, it's not enough. And um, and even if they do that, and at the moment uh, there is this all this uh, stalemate, uh, political stalemate in the United States in the Congress that uh, they don't know if they're going to send this another 60 billion aid in Ukraine funding. A senior NATO official told CNN, quote, the outcome of uh, in Ukraine depends on how each side is equipped to conduct this war. Yeah. So who is going to win this war? If these are the numbers and these are the estimates and these are the military experts saying that who, like, I remember, I think it was Napoleon back then who said, uh, uh, G- God is on the side of, uh, uh, they asked him on whose side is God or something, and he said God is on the side of uh, whoever has the bigger uh, artillery or the bigger uh, munition, right? And this is the same thing in uh, in in the Ukraine case. So, officials say Russia is currently firing around ten thousand shells a day, compared to just two thousand a day from the Ukrainian side, and this ratio is even less. They are around uh, six hundred of uh, this. Uh, Um, shells a day on other areas in Ukraine. The shortfall comes at perhaps the most perilous moment for Ukraine's war effort since Russia first marched on Kiev in February 2022. U.S. money for arming Ukraine has run out and Republican opposition in Congress has effectively halted giving any more. Meanwhile, Russia recently took the Ukrainian city of uh, of Avdivka and is widely seen as having the initiative on the battlefield. Ukraine is struggling not just with ammunition, but also growing manpower shortages on the front line. So munition, manpower, and lots of other things lacking for Ukraine to win this war. They don't care about the Ukrainians. They don't care. They're using them as cannon fodder in this war, unfortunately. And this is a brilliant uh, summary again by Che Boyce. He's a brilliant journalist. And he says, this is a war of resources and results. A conflict with its origins in a successful U.S.-backed anti-Russian coup in Kiev has turned into the single greatest foreign policy disaster for the White House since Vietnam. In this war of resources and resolve, Russia is, despite what the Western uh, media managed, or Ursula von der Leyen tells you, winning on both fronts. You don't have to agree or disagree with me, but you have to accept reality and the indisputable facts. As I've said before many times, Russia makes stuff, real things, in vast forges and in huge Soviet designated manufacturing cities whose furnaces and are roaring day and night. These forges and furnaces have been long closed in the US, while in Europe, the US destruction of Nord Stream decapitated Germany and Europe's industrial capacity. Here is what that looks like for Ukraine. Russia, without any external assistance from its powerful allies, is producing three times more artillery munitions, as we mentioned from the CNN article, than the US and Europe combined. And this, despite what the deluded pro-Ukrainian fan club celebrating the destruction of a single Russian plane or ship tells you, is a war of artillery, supremacy, manufacturing, and manpower. And then he mentions these numbers that we already um, uh, addressed in the CNN article and he continues as i have consistently written russia is running its vast artillery factories 24 7 on alternating 12 hours shifts over 3.5 million russians are are now working in the huge indigenous defense sector that's an increase of a million skilled workers in two years increasing from around 2.5 million before the conflict ukraine is now essentially a failed state absolutely reliant on aid both military and financial from its western paymasters the delusion that any amount of aid will do anything but delay the inevitable is clearly laid out here for any objective observer to see the outcome of this conflict is essentially already decided it is now a matter of how many unfortunate ukrainians have to die before the u.s tells zelensky to end it this is so fucking true that even the pope 
told Ukrainians that they have to have the courage to raise the white flag and negotiate with Russia um, because the alternative is more humiliation and more uh, hundreds of thousands more going to die in Ukraine. And there are no more men left. I don't know if you watched this one of these videos the other day, the border security of uh, Ukraine, they caught a van full of probably 50 Ukrainians trying to escape the country uh, through smugglers. Probably the smugglers are in touch with the security and they got the money, they gave it to the border police, shared it, and then they uh, they detained them in the border and they were brutalizing them and they are really, uh, yeah, they brutalized them, they hit them, they uh, humiliated them, they subjugated them, and they then sent them to the front lines. In two weeks, they're sending them to the front lines in a meat grinder, killing Ukrainians, Pure killing of Ukrainians. What's happening in Ukraine is just pure killing of Ukrainian men, while all these armchair so-called journalists and military experts sitting behind their desks and calling for more, more against Russia. Let's go, let's go, let's march toward Moscow, let's do it. You go. If you want to fight, you go. But you're a coward. You're not going to fight. You're sending the Ukrainians to their imminent death. And shame, shame, this is a big shame. And bigger shame is for the Ukrainian government to allow this to happen for their own people. Hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands are dying. For what reason? For ideological reasons? Because you're stubborn? Politics is the art of the possible, they say. What is possible and what is not possible? Is it possible for Ukraine to win against Russia? Is there anyone sane who think that they can win against Russia? And if Russia sees that they are going to lose this war, they're not going to use their nuclear weapons? No sane person could agree that Ukraine can win this war, but they are pushing more Ukrainians to their imminent death. Shame. This is a video I prepared uh, the other day about Victoria Nuland. I just cut it uh, shorter i'm just going to show you a little bit from it and uh, because the ending also fits what i'm talking now let's take a look the gravity of the ukraine war which was provoked by the neocons like nuland like joe biden like mccain for example cannot be underestimated the world nowadays is faced with hundreds of thousands of deaths among the ukrainians and the russians ukraine has permanently lost its sovereignty it has lost the crimean peninsula permanently and also lost the main industrial regions in the country. The European economies are suffering immensely and some even go further and say these economies are de-industrializing. Now opposite to the wishes of the neocons, Russia's military capabilities significantly increased. Also the economy of Russia is not suffering as they wanted. Russia, China and Tehran, the three pillars of the Eurasia region, pursued closer ties and this was the nightmare of the United States according to Brzezinski and his book. So all in all I think all the calculations that they have made to provoke this war or to harm Russia it backlashed against them and NATO countries nowadays have shown that their military capabilities and their military production are pretty limited compared to Russia and much of the world didn't obey to the US dictates to impose sanctions on Russia and after the recent Gaza onslaught and the accusations against Israel of committing genocide and taking Israel to the ICJ and the complicity of the United States with Israel, much of the world lost its respect to the United States as the leading power of the world. So we are faced nowadays with imminent threat of a nuclear exchange, especially with all this talk now that by France and other powers in the region that probably they have to send troops to Ukraine. Of course, there is a disagreement between the different European powers, but if this happens, then it could lead into a much worse situation in the region. So I would say all in all, the legacy of Victoria Nuland is pretty, pretty horrible. And what she did basically with the provocation of this war with Russia to draw a line in Ukraine and kill its aspirations to become an international power. But they did it on the expense of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians. And when Victoria Nuland was asked, this is what she said in this regard. Without sending a single U.S. soldier into combat 
and investing less than one-tenth of one year's defense budget of the United States, we have helped Ukraine destroy 50% of Russia's ground combat power, 50%, and 20% of its vaunted Black Sea fleet. Ukraine has taken off the battlefield 21 naval ships, 102 Russian aircraft, and 2,700 Russian tanks. By every measure, Ukraine's bravery and strength, its resilience, has made the United States safe. So the Ukraine war, according to Victoria Nuland, made the United States safer. I don't know what are the calculations and what are the metrics that she's measuring the safety of the United States, because as I mentioned, the nuclear threat is high. So, of course, this war didn't make the United States any safer, and worse still, she never speaks about the safety of the Ukrainians or safety of Ukraine, where these people are suffering immensely. And when she speaks about the casualties and the bravery of the Ukrainians, she doesn't show any empathy or sympathy to the Ukrainians. And this is one of the signs of a psychopathic person. And what about the European security, Miss Noland? So I think her legacy is uh, pretty bad. And uh, she could be characterized, of course, as a person who has done lots of evil acts so let's see where will she end up after her resignation probably she will go back to her family business to the think tank the institute for war affairs and continue publishing warmongering articles about my country syria calling for more intervention and probably also in ukraine because once a neocon always a neocon multiple american politicians have come out with similar statements over the years right senators, uh, secretaries of state, um, the president even on occasion, I think. But they're basically saying, this is a good deal for us. The Ukrainians are dying and the Russians are suffering. Great, let's beat the Russians via the Ukrainians. And, and you would expect that at some point Ukrainians also listen to this and begin to say, hey, who am I? Mm -hmm. You're treating me like an expendable pawn, which is exactly yes. what the Americans are doing. They're sacrificing them. They're sacrificing them. And the Ukrainian regime is going along with this and betraying, betraying its country. The government in Kiev is betraying its own country. This is also my opinion in this regard. What do you think, guys, about this live streaming? I just want to thank quickly um, Elena Diaz uh, for two times uh, for her um, very generous support. I think Putin's brother was only five years old and he was dressed in a mass grave when the Leningrad happened. And uh, Dino says, thank you, Kevok, for your continued excellent work. A piece from New York. Thank you so much, guys, really, for your uh, generous support and your comments. And especially uh, most of you guys for watching this uh, live streaming. Tomorrow I'm going to come back to you at 5 p.m. Central European time, of course, for another live streaming. I will let you know on my uh, YouTube and my social media accounts. Probably I may do it one hour later or one hour earlier. Let's see how the schedule is going to work tomorrow. But until then, please hit the like button. Subscribe to this video if you're new. I uh, That would really help me. And if you want to support my work, independent journalistic investigative work like the one I'm doing, you can become a patron. The link is scrolling on the screen patreon.com slash seriana analysis it enables me to continue to be to stay independent and continue making streams like this after hours and hours and hours of work and preparation i hope you appreciate it guys we see you tomorrow peace be upon you upon your families salam and by the way ramadan kevin for the muslim uh, followers i totally forgot about that i'm really sorry and happy fasting for you i know it's a little bit difficult but uh, happy ramadan to you all and i hope the uh, peace prevails uh, especially in uh, the gaza strip nowadays so salam to you all